Hi, everybody. This is Susan Fultonitti. I'm the manager of corporate marketing at Georgia Pacific. And uh, one of my responsibilities at GP is managing a program called Educational in Nature, which is designed to provide educational materials for fourth and fifth graders. And this is our second call. So um, during the first call, we had a whole different group of people. And um, one of the recurring themes we heard during that conversation was the need for teachers to adapt their everyday classroom activities and lesson plans to incorporate conservation lessons, maybe in math or social studies or language arts. So today's discussion is going to be focused on how teachers actually can integrate these lessons into their existing curriculum. Georgia Pacific wants to continue to grow and improve our standards and programs, and this panel is one of the ways for us to learn some more. Um, again, this time, Anna Hackman is our moderator, and we're thrilled to have her back again. So I will let Anna take over now. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm Anna Hackman. I'm the editor of Green Talk, a green living and business blog, and we'll be monitoring this panel discussion today on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is sustainability in education. First, I'd like to thank Georgia Pacific for the opportunity to interview all of you prior to this call. I am truly inspired by your dedication and make sure that the next generation is equipped to take care of the planet. So what I want to do first is I want to go through each one of the panelists and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background and the grades you work with. So I'm going to first start with Dan. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Strauss. Um, currently I work with the Nature Conservancy uh, with their program called Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future, or LEAF. Um, I've been with the Nature Conservancy for about a year and a half now with this program, which serves high school students. Uh, prior to that, I was a uh, New York City public school science teacher for 14 years. Um, and, and again, now I'm with this program. Vicki Davis. Uh, my name is Vicki Davis. I teach at Westwood Schools in Camilla, Georgia. Uh, I'm a technology teacher. I teach grades 8 through 12, but also the IT director and have worked with several um, cool projects here. I uh, also blog at the Cool Cat Teacher blog and am co-founder of the Flat Classroom Projects that link kids around the world to study uh, important topics uh, like conservation uh, and other technology-related and, and other topics. So glad to be here. Teresa Walsh. Hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Walsh. I'm Public Affairs Manager for Georgia Pacific's CrossFit facility in CrossFit, Arkansas. We're located in southeast Arkansas, and we are a mill site. Um, at our facilities, we have a consumer products GP facility, as well as a chemical facility and a plywood facility in our community. I've been with Georgia Pacific for 12 years now, and um, Happy to be a part of this conversation today and look forward to learning from other opportunities that you're going to provide. Is Colleen Ryan on the phone? Dr. Dennis, is he on the phone? Okay, not yet. Let's just start with the questions then. They'll probably be joining us later. Dan, explain to us about LEAF. What exactly is it sure. and what kind of schools do you work with? Sure. Um, so LEAF, uh, again, which stands for Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future, uh, it was a program started by the Nature Conservancy about 17 or 18 years ago as a partnership program with high schools in urban areas that have um, an environmental theme to their mission, to their programming, in some cases to their, to their school design. Um, and it began with one, one high school in New York City called the High School for Environmental Studies. Uh, how it worked then and how it works still is um, – a small number of students, a small group of students in their junior year of high school, they, they apply and they're chosen to go on a four-week paid internship in the summer where they work on Nature Conservancy preserves uh, around the country, and they are paired up with a mentor who often is a teacher at their school, um, and they gain very, very valuable um, both conservation work experience, so they're really out there doing, you know, really important conservation work, whether it be mapping uh, species, pulling invasive species, uh, working with uh, wildlife biologists to track uh, and monitor uh, endangered species, looking at uh, pollution to habitat and so forth. So they're gaining that experience, and they're also uh, gaining life skill experience. Uh, for many of them, for the first time, they're away from their families, and they are cooking their own meals and taking care of their own um, laundry and things like that, so it gives them that great life experience as well. 
Um, and it's a paid internship. So for many, it gives them their first taste of a, of a job and those responsibilities, um, and it gets them out of the city, uh, working in nature, which, um, you know, is just very, very valuable if you're going to care about uh, and be passionate about the environment and about nature. Uh, it's really important to make that personal connection. Um, so that was that was the idea, and that's, that's uh, how it was born. And then it became very successful, and it spread to a few other schools, and now uh, exists in, uh, we have 22 partner schools in cities across the United States, uh, and we serve over 100 students a summer. Um, and then in, in sort of a side piece to that is, is we started a, uh, an educators network working with teachers at those schools to uh, help them develop curriculum and bring new concepts and new uh, ways of thinking into their classrooms and into, the, uh, into their own curriculum development uh, as they do the great work that they're doing. So it's kind of this two-pronged approach um, that has really worked and has been very, very successful. Why juniors? Uh, we choose juniors for, for a few reasons. One is uh, we feel that it gives them the opportunity to come back for one more year to kind of share what they've learned with others in their student community, kind of be ambassadors of the program and help to promote the program for the next for the next wave. It's also a critical time because they'll be applying very soon to college, and it gives them some, uh, some new food for thought about uh, what we hope will be a decision on their part to pursue um, the environmental sciences as they, as they begin to think about college and beyond. Um, and lastly, by not doing it too soon in high school, you know, we find that they're a little bit at a higher maturity level to handle some of this independence and sort of life skill responsibilities, and also they've, uh, you know, they've been working on some academic skills that they can apply uh, to some of the work they're going to be doing in the field. Now, what have you found to really work well in this program? You've been with the program, what, two years? About almost two years, yeah. I think the, the key to the success of the program is this, this two-prong approach where we're giving the students this experience in the field, but we're not just letting it be this sort of magic dip into this summer program, but we're partnering with the schools and with the teachers at their schools. So it becomes a much more um, holistic uh, program where we don't just send them off on their lives and never uh, connect with them again, but we're constantly working with their schools throughout the school year. We're having professional development and um, uh, retreats with their teachers, uh, connecting the teachers with each other around the country, letting them share uh, the work that they're doing and the challenges that they're having, and giving the students this real rich network of connections. Um, for example, we this weekend we had a Green College and Career Fair, which the students who do the program are invited to, and we invite colleges and uh, organizations that have uh, internships in the environmental field. Um, so, you know, it's as if we're saying, we love that you did leave with us, and, and here's what else we have for you to help push you along in, in uh, hopefully pursuing this work further. So I think that's, that's, in my opinion, is really the key to the success of the program. And why only urban? Um, we find that it's kind of a uh, an underrepresented uh, uh, demographic in the environmental field. Um, cities have you know, for a very long time kind of been thought of as the opposite of, of where nature is. Um, and so consequently, people who live in cities don't usually get involved in the environmental conversation until recently, I think, as the urban and environmental movement has become stronger. Students in cities are not always getting all the benefits of, of rich environmental education. So that's what we wanted to focus. We wanted to focus on where it wasn't happening. You see, a while ago about diversity in the program? Sure. One of the things we look for in our partner schools um, is a diverse student population. So when a school wants to become a LEAF school, or we, we would like a school to become a LEAF school, uh, we look at three things. Um, do they have an environmental theme, which permeates all the way down into curriculum, not, not just uh, that they have a recycling club or something like that, but that's really embedded in what the school is, is about. Uh, number two, we look for a strong graduation rate. And the third thing is we look for a diverse student population. Um, you know, are, is there, is there uh, a good percentage of um, African-American students, Latino students, Caucasian students? 
um, Native American students. It doesn't always work out where it's, in, it's even 25%, 25%, so forth. But um, we want to see those numbers be, be rich in their diversity. Now, last question. One point that you brought up that I thought was uh, fascinating is you talked about teacher collaboration. Um, can mm-hmm. you explain a little bit more about that? I think you were, had told me previously through your uh, Facebook group. Yeah, so one of the main things that we're that we really love to do, and we're very proud of, that's part of the program, is this this teachers network. So um, when a, when a school becomes a lead school, we uh, we ask for a commitment of at least one to two teachers to join this network, and then once they have, they have access to um, a lot of things that we provide, which includes uh, webinars. Um, We've created a, uh, a Facebook group page um, for them to be able to communicate and share curriculum ideas. Uh, we hold an annual retreat where we invite all the uh, schools to send one to two teachers, and we bring in um, guest speakers, and we, we, uh, we have workshops and professional development. But what we find is the most powerful thing is whenever we get these teachers together, they just love talking to each other, and they feel like, they're so happy that there's an opportunity to talk to someone who's doing, you know, the same kind of work in the same kind of school with the same kind of challenges that they're, that they're trying to do. Um, and these are universal things. You know, a teacher in New York City and a teacher in L.A. are facing the same kinds of challenges, whether it be the, um, the need to meet state standards and state, uh, state core curriculum while trying to infuse environmental issues or whether it's trying to, um, you know, raise test scores um, and deal with all the challenges of, of inner, city, inner, inner city poverty and so forth and still trying to do this environmental mission. So they just kind of feel comforted by the fact that they've met others out there and that they don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel, that other people are doing great work too and they can share it and be inspired by it and, and try it out in their own way. And one of the main projects we're working on along those lines is uh, – a curriculum anthology um, of best practices in urban environmental education, which teachers from these schools are contributing to, and uh, it's set for publication in early 2013. And then that will be disseminated to even more schools as we take it to conferences and um, make it available online. It's a great segue for Vicki now to talk about some of the things she's doing, because it sounds like she's doing something very much along those same lines. Vicki, talk to me about how you've you know, created creative ways that you've brought in um, conservation into um, your classroom, especially about your Flint River project. Sure. One of the things I really believe is vital is what I call teacherpreneurship, which is teachers customizing the classroom. And, um, you know, we have to, we're in schools now, we're making originals, we're not making copies. The only copy should be in the copy room. So it's so vital when we're dealing with science or conservation that we get kids hands-on. We get them out in the field and doing things. And I'm actually the the daughter of a farmer. And, you know, getting outdoors, you know, it does something. It changes things. And um, we had a project at our school at Westwood um, about – it's been about two years ago now – where we actually, um, the last week and a half of school after we had completed finals and we, we scheduled things early, we actually um, took all of our high school um, out of the traditional high school rotation and we split them up into groups and we had the Flint River Project. It's at flintriver.ning.com. We actually, um, Daniel will be interested to hear this, we had some folks from the Nature Conservancy actually were on some of our videos and participate in some of the things that we did uh, down here, mm-hmm. and uh, the students documented all about the river. So we had one group that uh, collected invertebrates. We had another group that studied water quality. It was very interesting. Um, for quite some time, people have been saying, don't swim in the Flint, don't swim in the Flint, and our water quality uh, trend showed the, a, a big improvement in the Flint River's water quality. A lot of people started trusting the Flint again, which had a lot to do with what the students did because it was kind of an independent uh, group. So that was just one thing of, of customizing um, what you're doing to really get kids out and get them involved. We're a very project-based learning uh, school, and so uh, getting them out there, you know, really changed their views of the area and conservation and the community. Now, one of the one of the things that we were having our discussion prior to this conference call that really intrigued me. Remember, we talked about the Google twenty percent rule and how you're teaching yeah. that. Yeah. Uh huh. Expand um, on that, that a little bit for me. Yeah, 
Yes, that's one way, um, you know, to customize my classroom. Uh, Google has their employees spend 20% of their time on a personal interest project. And they've actually found that over 50% of their innovations happen during that 20%. Um, so I actually uh, saw something similar in Evansville, Indiana, when I was speaking there um, a couple summers ago. So last year, I brought the 20% time to my classroom. The students spend 20% of their time in my computer fundamentals class on a personal interest project. And because we're in a rural area, um, we had projects uh, from GPS, um, conservation of wildlife to uh, some students made a recycling video um, promoting recycling, doing animations, um, all different types of projects to promote uh, different types of uh, conservation that are important to them or to their families or uh, to the community. So, um, you know, I just think it's so important to get kids out there. You know, the other thing I'll mention is that this whole networking, uh, Dan talked about how Teachers are connecting, and they get so excited. And there's such a network on Twitter. In fact, anybody who's really doing things in conservation should know about Eco Monday on Twitter. It's a hashtag. And it's kind of the way that people who are ecologists and are around that uh, conversation communicate. So no matter what my students are doing, whether it's in ecology or whatever field they're interested in, I want them to have um, what I call an NQ or networking quotient, understanding how to find and mobilize and be part of the networks that really influence how people think. Because it's not just about learning it yourself. It's about influencing positive change for the causes that you believe in. And so that is also integrated in with a 20% time project. Now, you're also just not doing locally. You're also doing globally. Can you expand mm -hmm. on that? Uh, yes, the Fat Classroom Projects we have, um, we started about five years ago. We are in Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. The first project started off with just two classrooms, one in Bangladesh and then mine uh, in Camilla, Georgia, uh, studying Friedman's book, The World is Flat. We ended up in the book and won uh, several uh, awards, and it's now become uh, seven different projects. Over 3,000 kids just this semester are part of it, but one of our projects uh, we really wanted to focus on um, understanding and talking about uh, natural resources on a global basis. And um, our current debate for the Eracism Project, uh, it's eracism.flatclassroomproject.org, is about uh, natural resources on a global scale. And this, a lot of schools no longer have debate in their school. And so this is a way that students can debate virtually and we have China, U.S., Canada, Mexico, Slovakia, Argentina, and Saudi Arabia all in this particular debate. And they're discussing, um, you know, natural resources on a global scale and how we need to be conserving and managing those resources. So, um, you know, citizen science is also a big part of what I think is important for every classroom. I think that every classroom a uh, science classroom or STEM classroom should have citizen science as a component. Uh, there's something that every classroom, whether you're technology or English or language arts, we can all do something to talk about conserving this this beautiful but finite world. We just we have this has to be important for all of us because we all share the same planet. And we're all breathing the same air. Um, can you expand about what citizen science means? Sure. Citizen science is a trend that's really happened with Web 2.0 and the Internet, the ability for us to upload and share. You know, not only are we able to share eBay rankings or Amazon ratings, but we're able to take measurements and share share what we learn. And there's so many incredible citizen science projects. There's Frog Watch USA. There's Project Bud Burst. Um, we're part of the Shout Learning Project um, that is, is – co-sponsored by Microsoft of where we're tree banding and we, we have banded trees and then we take measurements and send those to the Smithsonian. Um, there's a great website called SciStarter.com, which is a wonderful place to find these citizen science projects. And what the scientists do is you've got this massive collection of data and because you have so much data coming in from around the world or around the country, they're actually able to get some very valid uh, statistical analysis of different trends, whether they're looking at, at weather patterns or migration patterns, and they're able to really detect things uh, that they couldn't before. So citizen science, I believe, is a civic responsibility, but also helps the students to get out in the field and get excited about what they're doing in it, and it adds meaning 
to, to what they're doing in the classroom. So there's so many great places you can go to find out about citizen science, but I, I truly believe that, that science teachers have a, have a responsibility to their profession uh, to, to join in citizen science projects. And you can start at a very young age and move up. Um, I've actually, in uh, Chapter 2 of my book, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds, we've got a whole section on citizen science and the kind of things that, that, that classrooms need to be doing to, um, to really uh, connect with other classrooms and scientists. Now, last question. With all these challenges that you're seeing in the classroom now, you know, with all the educational testing and things like that, what resources have you turned to for either business or the community to help you with your conservation efforts with the students? Well, you know, for, for us and, and for all of our different uh, projects, you know, you really want to try to customize the classroom. And we've kind of found that, um, you know, right now, for example, uh, the Nature Conservancy there locally is trying to do some things with variable um, rate irrigation systems which can serve water so well and so they came to us and they said we've got this video we need a student to make a video and one of my students is actually working on that video as part of his 20 percentile project so we've got to open the doors of, of communication it would be incredible if we could have you know some STEM uh, STEM is the um, I guess the umbrella for so many initiatives that are happening now particularly here in the United States because our future ability to have a thriving economy and a thriving country is solely rested on our ability to be able to to recruit and encourage our students to go into STEM fields. So I believe that we need to start having local community STEM steering committees or groups where you have science teachers talking with local businesses. Local businesses need to be coming in on science days and, and making their um, – you know, letting their scientists Skype in with classrooms and communicate. Um, when we ha when the oil spill was happening, uh, some of our students actually Skyped with um, with a, uh, a meteorologist in the Gulf, talking to them about exactly what was happening at that moment. And so we've got a, what we call flatten the classroom, which is bring in outside people into the classroom and the students out of the classroom and connect. Uh, so I think it's very important to have this kind of virtual volunteerism. The, the, the people that work for businesses don't actually have to leave the business and drive to the school. We can do this over Skype. We can do this over Blackboard Collaborate. We can do this through wikis. There's so many creative ways we can do this and create these mutually beneficial uh, symbiotic learning relationships where we're actually learning from each other. Colleen, Ryan has joined us on the call. Colleen, we hadn't, didn't have a chance to get a little bit of your background. Can you give us a little bit of your background? Uh, yes, I teach in an upstate rural uh New York State School, and um, I teach eighth grade mathematics, and I've been teaching now for about uh, 20 years. And um, my kind of mission in the past few years has been to try to find ways to incorporate environmental issues into the mathematics classroom. Now, you attended a, a Keystone workshop. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, Georgia Pacific sponsored uh, my participation at Keystone, which is a workshop that is held in uh, Colorado that um, is a model framework, uh, kind of a decision-making model for uh, environmental issues. And uh, what they did is they uh, presented this framework and um, then took us through a uh, series of activities that um, included science, social studies, mathematics and English language art and kind of demonstrated how we could take an environmental issue, identify it, and then uh, teach us how to incorporate it into several different content areas. And then um, what I really liked about it was at the end was we had a uh, panel discussion because uh, one of the key facets to this workshop was the fact that there are many stakeholders. They tried to take a non-biased approach and try to use research uh, and make decisions based on that research and data, and that there are different points of view in solving environmental issues and problems. What I find interesting is that is that you're a math teacher, and when we talked earlier uh, in our private conversation, how are you going to take that back as a math teacher to your classroom, that information that you learned at Keystone? Well, part of mathematics, of course, is problem solving, so that was a perfect fit. 
but my my challenge is um, identifying the environmental issue that I will be bringing back to my classroom. Um, I plan on using uh, either water quality issues or uh, maybe some global climate change issues and uh, using that data for my classroom. But um, I'm finding that my biggest challenge is identifying data and finding ways of meeting the rigor that's required of, of where, you know, the common core learning standards in mathematics at eighth grade. But um, yeah, I've done similar projects to this before, and uh, it takes a lot of work, but uh, I am able to bring these types of issues into my classroom. So you, would that be for next year when you when you're going to integrate this uh, curriculum, or is that going to be starting right away? Or um, I haven't had uh, the opportunity yet to begin this, but uh, my intention is to begin this when I begin my uh, unit on statistics and linear functions, and then. Um, in the spring after my state exam, then I would like to do a culminating project with my students. And what do you what do you hope for the outcome with your with your students with this program? My my hope is to teach my students uh, how to make decisions based on data, to be able to interpret that data, um, become critical thinkers, and also teach them that that they can actually connect with their backyard and, and look outside their door and identify environmental issues that there are many things that take for granted. I mean, I, I use water quality often, and they're very surprised at the amount of water they consume. And uh, I have them do a water, like their own little water meter, where they keep track of their water usage for just a day, and they're amazed by this, and also they discuss it with their parents, which I absolutely love. I mean, how often do my students go home and talk about school and math class? And this is one of those times where I feel like I've really made an impact on them and um, their future citizenship. Let's move on to Teresa from Georgia Pacific. Teresa, we talked a lot about um, what you were actually doing in the mill to uh, further education in the community. Give us some ideas, some of the programs that you're, you've been instituted in the community. Well, I think this is a perfect segue into one of the programs that we have at, at our Cross at uh, Georgia Pacific facility. We call it the Georgia Pacific Waterways Festival, and it's, it focuses on H2O, what a way to teach kids about the environment when we spend a day uh, learning about conservation and stewardship and having a lot of fun along the way in doing so. Our goal is to give our elementary students a fun learning experience in an outdoor classroom that would highlight and benefit the quality environment and prepare them to be conscientious stewards of our natural resources. It comes from dipping screens into pulp and water for paper making to building a butterfly garden and learning why Georgia the camel has three eyelids and is capable of drinking up to 30 gallons of water a minute, to seeing firsthand the effects of pollution on a watershed. The students learn more about the importance and everyday value of water, the environment, to, each, to them individually and to each person. And I love the idea of them actually monitoring and measuring their water consumption for a day. This is, um, we found this project to be a wonderful learning experience. It's developed for our fourth grade students at our elementary schools. It's organized by our company. Uh, we take the groups and we divide the group of students, the fourth graders, into 12 to 13 students per group. We place each group in a colorful GP waterway shirt so we can identify which group is which. And the students rotate through various learning stations throughout the day. So it goes from water and nature and water and agriculture to maybe water and industry and water and conservation. And we have over a dozen other experts that partner with us in teaching the students about the water-related issues. And we set this all up in our city park and zoo. 
uh, we found that students go from saying basically, ooey, bugs are gross to bugs are awesome before the day's over. And we have a wastewater treatment station set up at one of our GP stations as well as a, obviously a GP paper making station and a GP sustainability station for trees and the value that trees provide in our lives and in our processes here at the mill. Some of the other groups that we partner with, we invite organizations such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they provide a, a section on uh, watershed. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, uh, they come and they bring a portable aquarium with them, with them, so they teach about all the species of fishes and just the importance of clean water and the habitat that fishes live in. We have everything, like I said, from a butterfly garden that we expand every year to we even actually include our local rescue unit to talk about boating safety and water safety. And of course, as I said, we certainly have our GP facilities there represented. It's just a truly an outstanding environmental experience for not only the students, but we found it for the teachers as well. This year marks our fourth year for the project. And we've just found that by the end of the day, the youngsters have a better understanding of why water is such an important part of their lives and how that they can, as fourth grade students, become more responsible consumers of water in, with what they use every day, what their family uses, and how we use it as a community. So it's been a great, great project for Georgia Pacific and one we're very, very proud of. You also are doing some other uh, programs as well with um with women. Can you expand upon we do, that? Um, we have several other educational programs in our school systems, and we have just found, honestly, that um, for us, we feel that we've created a great relationship and a partnership with our schools, and it's a partnership of um, what we can do to help the schools. And the schools came to us with a, with a problem that they cited in finding that some of our young girls were not engaged in the math and science classes as much as what the young men were. So we had developed, worked with a, with a local teacher. In fact, it was a teacher who has gone through the GP Keystones Key Institutes program several years back. Just a wonderful, outstanding teacher in our middle school. And we developed a program called Girls Engaged in Engineering. And it just provides a glimpse of engineering uh, to, to girl students. It's a volunteer program. It's a Saturday program for girls that highlights um, different elements of engineering, whether it be environmental, civil, mechanical, uh, chemical, aeronautical. But it's all targeted toward uh, encouraging those girls to excel in math and science classes. We uh, take girls to grades 3 through 12, have about 30 students in the program each year. As I said, it's a Saturday class held once a month. And it's, each of the classes uh, have a fun activity type uh, educational program various, based on the various fields of the engineering, obviously. And our GP engineers volunteer to go and help. Maybe this, maybe one month they're building paper rockets or maybe they're building a mass trial um, race car and they're learning about the engineering skills to do those type of projects. And we found that the, the older students, like the 10th and 11th and 12th grade girls, serve as great mentors to those younger students. And um, at the end of the year, we provide a field trip to some educational place, such as the Huckabee Nature Center in Pine Bluff, which is close by, or the NASA Space Science Center in Little Rock, or even the Arkansas Science Museum. And the cool thing about the Science Museum, is it also includes an overnight campout in the museum itself. So that's always a fun ending to the program each year. And this year marks our fifth year for that program, and uh, we've received a lot of state and national attention from the program. So we're, we're very, very pleased with that. A program that is similar in that nature, but it also focuses on math and science, and we partner with the South Arkansas Community College, and it's a program designed for eighth grade girls. The program, um, actually the university 
administers the program, and we just partner with the university. But there are about eight to ten school districts throughout southern Arkansas that participate in the program, and it's a hands-on workshop also with breakout sessions. And it targets science and technology and the engineering and the math fields, as well as the environmental fields. And the intent of the program as well is to introduce female students. In this case, it's more targeting um, engineering professions. So we take our female engineers from the mill facility, and we go into those breakout sessions, and the engineers spend the day sharing their engineering background with the students, and they provide the students insight into some of the fields here at Georgia Pacific as well. And the whole hope behind this program is to inspire those eighth grade students across our state uh, to take those classes and to take those harder math and science-based classes that will set them in a position when they do um, graduate from high school and go on to other educational opportunities, that they have the foundation and the background that they're going to excel in. Now, you're also doing some partnering with um, with the schools as well, other ways. Can you expand on that? We do. We, um, each year we provide... Um, some of the ways that we do it is we provide grant funding for teacher recognition and, more importantly, for special classroom projects that the school cannot otherwise fund uh, by the school district. And we feel like it's equally important that we not only provide the money for those programs, but we also provide the time and leadership in the classroom. And, um, you know, perhaps it's with the robotics team or a Quizmo team, or maybe it's a library reading club, or even things like a drug awareness program or a character building program. But it's a lot of times programs that, in many cases, there's not even a direct cost to it. One particular program that comes to my mind is where we go into the classroom, and the first thing we do in that classroom is we say, you know, we'd like to offer each of you a job, and we're going to pay you $10 an hour. And they all get, you know, great big eyes, and then we say, well, I'll tell you what, you're such good students, we're going to pay you $12 an hour. And everybody's ready to sign up to come work at Georgia Pacific. And then we begin to say, now, let's see, you're going to want to live on your own, so it's going to cost you X amount for rent. Now, what kind of car do you want to drive, and how much is that payment going to be? And you're going to have to have some insurance, and you probably are going to want to keep that cell phone. And so we go through the list of all the things it's going to take for them to live, and by the end of the presentation, they've come to realize that $12 an hour at a job cannot sustain the livelihood that they want to enjoy. So... It's programs like that that a lot of time it's just time and effort on our part, but the learning is there, and um, it's a great opportunity for us as Georgia Pacific employees, as well as it's good for our school system and our students as well. Some of the things that um, that we found are like, um, you know, when your children were young and you have these wonderful Christmas presents and they'd want to play with the box instead of the gift inside of it. And a lot of times we found that to be the case with with, uh, with classroom projects. A lot of times it is our, our dedication of time and effort in the classroom or helping that classroom teacher with a project that encourages the classroom teacher as well as leaves a learning experience, whether it be like our GP Waterways Festival or our girls engaged in engineering, it just provides a memorable experience that will last a lifetime for those kids. Now, how do you? How would you like to see your program expanded in the next few years? I guess in listening to um, you know to some of the comments today that were so exciting to hear, you know I certainly like to see some of the programs that we feel have been very very successful for for Georgia Pacific and particularly in our community. You know, I'd like to see those programs expanded outside of the CrossFit in the Arkansas area. You know, perhaps it be, you know, whether it be providing kits to schools or other ways that they can just benefit from our successes. One of the things that we've looked at doing before and just haven't taken the leap of faith yet to do it, but we'd like to build an outdoor classroom that could be used year-round, not only for our local schools, but for drawing other schools and neighboring districts to our area. We have an area rich in history in the fact that 
um, we started as a sawmill town, and we're one of Georgia Pacific's leading manufacturers in the paper making industry and the consumer products industry. So we have a great story to share with students, and you know, providing an outdoor classroom gives us a more flexible ability to do some of those things that otherwise would require travel on our part to, to other outside areas. Another thing that I think would be great if we could expand it would be to expand our meal management leadership in the schools to include um, a focus on entrepreneurship programs. Um, we know well how to run a business at Georgia Pacific, but we also have the ability to be able to share some of those important key learnings with educators and with students. You know, whether it be customer service or whether it be people skills, um, just focusing on our brands and the sustainability of our business, I just feel like that there's an area of opportunity, particularly in our region of the nation um, and in our, in our particular location in the state of Arkansas, that this could make a substantial difference for the livelihoods of our students. We actually have Brian Dennis, who has joined us, who is with the Aquarium. Tell us a little bit about your background first. Um, I'm actually a former teacher, um, taught middle school science for uh, several years, and the director of the Math, Science, and Technology Magnet Program in Cobb County, Georgia. And um, started my career uh, working in education with zoos and aquariums. And um, now I serve as the Vice President of Education and Training with the Georgia Aquarium. So tell us a little bit about some of the programs that you're doing over at the aquarium. Uh, we have a wide range of programs um, really uh, geared to the whole range of the student spectrum from pre-K right on up to college programs. Um, they're all assigned, aligned with the Georgia Performance Standards, so we basically focus on the curriculum and utilizing the educational opportunities as an enhancement tool uh, for the classroom teacher. And then we have uh, public programs that we wind up doing for the general public. One of those programs are overnight programs, uh, and it's really growing quite a bit in the um, student segment. Uh, we develop curriculum aligned with the state and national standards there as well. And then we do a wide range of professional development programming for teachers as well. And tell us a little bit about um, individual programs that you've had geared towards each segment. Just give us a little bit of taste of each one. All right. Um, for the primary grades, um, particularly the pre-K to, to first and second, a lot of those programs are centered around utilizing the aquarium. And I'll give you one example. Um, one program is geared around the storybook. So we really um, help students um, identify uh, letters and alphabets and basic foundations with um, key words that they will become familiar with. And it's a story centered around our character for the aquarium. So we utilize um, exhibits and, and highlight some of the different um, ecosystems there to really help them become familiarized with some of the letters and and numbers and basic math skills as well as um, basic language skills. And then we're also introducing them to science concepts as well. So we can um, tweak those programs to make sure that all of the standards are integrated as well. Once we get into upper elementary school, um, they will start their introduction into some of the foundations related to research. So they may come into the aquarium and um, visit some of the exhibits and uh, learn a little bit about animal behavior and food and diet, um, calculating some basic um, math related to food quantities and, and volume um, in relation to some of the exhibits. But once you move into middle school, we actually get uh, quite a bit more advanced and delve into scientific research a bit more, and they're actually at exhibits collecting some animal behavior research, um, learning about um, one of the key organisms we work with is the belugas. So they're learning quite a bit about belugas, how they behave, and um, a bit about natural history and anatomy related to um, a whole range of organisms throughout the aquarium. 
And then once we get into high school programming, we actually work with the teacher a lot more and customize their programming a bit more to make sure that it focuses in on the biology, integrates some of the physics and physical science, and they're moving, moving it, making their way through the aquarium. And some of it may even involve them designing some exhibits. So we may give them the foundation of, say, you're designing an exhibit for a whale shark, you need to do your research and find out what it needs um, as far as food and as far as um, volume of water and how do you plan for the growth rates and um, all of those sort of mechanisms that the, the students get quite involved with and it's truly a learning experience for them. And then once we get to college, we work with the professor to find out what they're learning in class and basically customize an experience. Uh, for the college students. But a lot of those students are also pre-service teachers, um, so they're learning how to utilize the aquarium and how to develop the uh, curriculum for their classes um, based on the national and state curriculum standards. One of the, the interesting points that you made when we had our conversation prior to this conference call is how do you actually develop the programs to meet the needs of your educators? You have a whole system in place about that. Oh, yeah. Um, we're, we've been really excited about this. I was actually hired number eight onto the aquarium staff, which is two years before they're open. Um, so having the education team um, in place so early was, was phenomenal for us. But I also, having been in the classroom and having been an administrator, I was very much aware that it is extremely difficult to keep your eyes and ears on the pulse of every aspect of what's going on in the education realm. So what we developed early on was an educational advisory committee, which is actually comprised of teachers, administrators, um, other informal education institutions, some corporate entities, university representatives. And we come together quarterly, and we basically share our ideas about where we plan on going, and um, curriculum that we'd like to um, develop, programs we would like to roll out. And this committee or this advisory group actually gives us awesome insights about um, how we could chart our path to make sure it's the most successful program. They also put us in contact with other in um, individuals or corporations or entities that can enhance that program for us. So they wind up being this tremendously valuable asset to us and helping us keep our eyes and ears about what's going on in the educational community and um, linking us up with the appropriate resources to make sure that the programs are the best that they could possibly be. Now, if you have any advice to give on how not-for-profits or even schools could collaborate with businesses other than for money, what would you suggest? Oh, the, um, we have – the Education Advisory Committee is a great idea. Um, it really is a great way to have other entities partner in. It's not necessarily um, a, a giving of um, a financial giving, but the resource that they provide and the networking opportunity. And they're a, a great advocate out in the community for you um, as far as linking you with other opportunities. We also um, have um, individuals come in and volunteer at the aquarium as well. So those opportunities wind up giving um, corporate entities an opportunity to see how the facility works and actually get on the front line of dealing with some of our um, our guests. Now, last question that I, I should have probably asked in the middle of this. Of your programs, what have you found are working really, really well? <laughs> um, I don't, that's a great question. We like to think that we're doing everything pretty well. But I, um, I think... One of the things that we do really well is basically at the end of every season, um, we shut down the program and we revisit every program from top to bottom. And we assess and, and do our best to take our feelings and emotions out of things and find out what works really well, no matter how great we thought contributing a certain aspect to a program, no matter how great it may have been in our eyes, we really do sort through all of the feedback from our guests and our students and our teachers to ensure that it's really the best experience it can possibly be. And um, and then we work to revise, and every year is a continual change. All of these programs are dynamic to ensure that they are always the best quality programs 
and they're really meeting the goals and, the, and objectives that we've established. But one other thing that's really worked well for us is we have developed immersive learning experiences for our teachers. So one program that we've developed, um, Rivers to Reef, actually is a program that takes teachers from the headwaters of a river system here in Georgia, and they follow that river system over the course of five days all the way out to the coast of Georgia. Um, they spend a night on Sapelo Island, and then they go out to Gray's Reef Marine Sanctuary 18 miles offshore. That experience really immerses teachers in the learning environment. They really get to understand the aquatic ecosystem. They understand the interconnectedness of land and water and water uses in Georgia. And they come back um, so fulfilled from that experience. And they also know that we're really committed to them having the opportunity to enhance their classroom because those learning experiences ultimately make their way into enriching learning experiences for their students. So I'm going to go back to all the panelists um, and go back and just have you all sum up one key point that you want everybody to take away from this conversation about your particular program that you find like the most important thing that's working for what you're doing. So I'm going to start with you, Dan. Just that, that combination of sort of hitting them from two points of view, um, providing them with that opportunity to be in the field with conservationists, learning job skills, learning conservation work skills, learning life skills, um, visiting colleges while they're out there getting ready for that journey, and then uh, supporting their schools uh, however we can through curriculum, professional development, linking them to other organizations, helping them create partnerships like some of the great partnerships that we've I've heard from tonight. So just building that, that sort of network to help them, uh, you know, be successful, hopefully pursuing college and beyond in, in environmental conservation. Vicki? You know, my message is really um, to every teacher, you can't do everything, but you can do something. What are you doing to be hands-on? How are you getting kids outside? Um, how are you being a teacherpreneur and customizing your classroom? How are you helping children understand um, that they are originals, they are unique. We've got to bring the passion and the uniqueness. And, you know, we've always been so great at creativity here in the United States. Uh, we've always made originals, but then we've, we've gone so heavy on the standardized testing that it's easy to lose sight of that. And, you know, I'm just, um, Colleen, I just have to tell you, all the speakers are incredible. But, um, you know, Colleen is fighting a tough fight. She's got all of these new standards. She's having to be a teacherpreneur and customize her classroom, and we need people like like Colleen, and we need programs like has been mentioned tonight. Um, there are programs out there, and, you know, the biggest message to all teachers is that you can do everything, but you can do something. And what will be that something to help your students understand the importance of preserving our wonderful, beautiful world that that we are we are stewards of, and we've got to take good care of it, and, and that starts in the classroom, talking to our students about what we need to be doing, and also getting them out into it. Colleen, uh, I appreciate your comments, Vicky, and it is it's a huge challenge, and it, you know I have this internal struggle within me uh, every day that I walk into my classroom, and it's a tough rope to walk between doing what I know is right for my students and uh, you know not succumbing to the pressures of the standardized testing craze that I'm sure will come to pass eventually. But um, I, I just I'm looking for resources and opportunities in my backyard on how I can integrate environmental issues into the mathematics classroom, and it's it's been a huge challenge for me, and I am keeping up the good fight. Teresa? I think from a business perspective, um, I guess what I'd like to end with is, you know, at Georgia Pacific, we take it very seriously, our environmental responsibility as a company. We're proud of our environmental uh, stewardships that we have. Um, for us, it's more than just meeting standards and goals and rules and regulations that are set forth by state and federal agencies. It's about, you know, the place that we call home. It's about where our employees live. It's about not only where we do business, but it's just about the way of life that we all enjoy. And for us, conservation is, you know, we talked about water today, and we talked about some of the engineering fields that, that we use at this facility. 
But I guess as much as anything, as I just want to close by saying, you know, we think it's about we think it's about the whole student, and that we have a responsibility that we are proud to share and partner with, not only with other businesses in, in our community, but individuals in our community and surrounding area. We're proud of our teachers and we're proud of our school system, but we know that we still have a long way to go. And the only way that we're going to be completely successful is when we're all working together toward the common goal, and that common goal is that child. And um, we just consider it an honor to be a company in America that we have the opportunity to make a difference, and we feel like we're making a difference. And I do appreciate all the conversation that took place today. It's encouraging to hear the teachers and the comments and the the programs that you're involved with and the enthusiasm that you have. It's um, it is a passion and it is something that you're blessed with. And I do appreciate everyone on the call today. And last but least, Brian. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> having been a classroom teacher and in my current role, the thing that I would like to really get across is that education is truly. It is no small task to educate our students, and not throughout the state and, and not throughout the country. It's no small task. It is the collective effort of teachers that work tremendously hard in the classroom each and every day, and organizations and corporations, um, businesses, and all of these entities coming together to ensure that our students really get the most enriching learning the opportunity that they could possibly ever have. And we always have to keep in mind that many of them learn through seeing and, and touching and feeling and experiencing. And, and it's a collective effort that we're all going to have to put together. And we have a, a wonderful organization to be able to, to, to take students to places that they've never been before. But we continue to need to, amazing teachers to create and recreate experiences in the classroom each and every day so that students get just each and every opportunity that can be afforded to them. So one of the things that I really want people to know is that we are here to do whatever we can possibly do to, to create the most enriching learning experience for students and teachers. We're here to make sure that that happens. Panelists, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to pass it back to Susan now. Well, thank you, everyone. That was um, a fascinating conversation. I know I learned a lot of things that were going on out there, and everybody brought a great perspective to it. So thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Anna, for being our hostess once again. And we will look forward to our next call.